kind of a lot of folks with the flu, a lot of folks that are sick, and um, Sister Lynn and Sister Baker both are, I think, I think under the weather. I know Sister Lynn is, and um, so there's no music this morning. Everybody else is in Sunday school class, so why don't you stand with me, <coughs> and we're going to pray. Amanda and Brittany are here with a brand new granddaughter and daughter, and uh, that's very nice. New baby rule. Everybody wants to hold them, and uh, moms and grandmas don't want to offend anybody, but I'm going to tell you, keep your hands off that baby, all right? Uh, there's a flu bug going around, so you can look, but don't touch. Uh, let her get a couple, three weeks old and get her immune system built up a little bit, and then you can hold her, all right? You can coo and all, but don't touch that baby, all right? We got a lot of people. We do. Sue and Tony texted me this morning, and they're sick. Sister Lynn is sick. Um, Amber's got sick kids. Uh, I got a sore throat. So it's going around. So we need to pray for just everybody that's sick, that's not here this morning, and then ask the Lord to help us in Sunday school. Let's pray. God, we love you. <clears throat> we magnify your name this morning. Thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity we have to be in your house, to feel your presence and your love. Help us today, God. Touch everyone that's sick and afflicted this morning. Move in our presence, we pray. In the name of Jesus, we love you, we trust you, we believe you. Thank you for your goodness to us, God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Shake your neighbor's hand and smile at him and tell him it's good to see him in Sunday school this morning. I got... This is a good lesson this morning, so I brought in the shovel. And uh, since it's such a good lesson, I brought the shovel in because whenever I preach real good or teach real good, it seems like everybody always wants to shovel it off on somebody else and, and make sure that somebody else knows that it's for them, so... And since it's such a good lesson this morning, I brought a big shovel. So just make sure that you get a hold of this and uh, make sure you get it to your, to your neighbor or your friend or whoever it is that you feel like you need to do that for. <clears throat> because this morning we're going to talk about being a disciple. Part of being a disciple is learning to live unselfishly. Uh, living unselfishly. When um, we think about life and and uh, living and uh, all of these things that we do, uh, sometimes we get caught up in thinking a lot about ourselves. If we look at our lesson this morning and the and the the main text uh, for our lesson, the thrust of what. Uh, we're going to try to learn this morning. We find in 1 Thessalonians 3, 12 and 13, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another. And Paul told the Thessalonian church, even to all men, even as we do toward you, which is where that uh, good old saying, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, uh, mindset comes from. Paul said, to the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. And then in Romans, Paul told the Roman church, let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. So there was a man that was traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho. And in his journey from Jerusalem to Jericho, the Bible tells us that he was ambushed by a band of thieves. And um, he was caught completely unaware. 
and he was unable to adequately defend himself. So he was beaten to the point where he almost died, robbed of all of his possessions, <coughs> and he was abandoned on the side of the road. It was a pretty busy road, though, thank the Lord, right? It was used by dozens of people every day. But he laid there dazed, confused, and dying. He was in a mess. His life was a mess. He had real problems. Laying on the side of the road, bleeding, beaten, probably broken bones. His life was a mess. His life was a mess. I really want to get that point. We're really going to, the biblical perspective, not mine, not yours, not the church's, not pastor so-and-so 50 years ago, the biblical perspective. This man laid on the side of the road, beaten, robbed, and dying, right? His life was a mess. And he thought he was going to lay there and die until he heard footsteps of somebody coming. And when he heard the footsteps, he let out the loudest moan that he could, hoping to get the attention of the person passing by. And he did get their attention. It was a priest. Preacher. Priest. A Christian. Sanctified. He'd been in church a long time. Man that had been around the, the church all of his life. And he looked at him, and he said, You're a mess. Your life is a mess. But you're a Samaritan and I'm not and I don't have time to mess with you. And he crossed the road and went on. He took the time to tell him, you need God more than I do. You need help more than I do. But he didn't help him. Because telling people... When they're laying beside the road, listen to me. You need to listen to me this morning. When they've been beaten, robbed, their bones are broken, and they're laying beside the road dying, they don't need you to tell them, hey, it looks like you've been beaten. It looks like your bones are broke. It looks like you're dying. But I don't have any good advice for you, so I'm moving on down the road. They don't need you to tell them that. Nobody ever needs you to tell them that you look like you're laying by the road, beaten, broken, and dying. If they're laying by, I want to make sure you get this this morning, so I might say this once or twice. If they're laying on the side of the road and they've been robbed and their body's beaten and their bones are broken and they're dying, they don't need anybody to tell them that. They're the ones that are laying there dying. The biblical perspective is it's not your responsibility to tell them where they're at. Jesus made a point of letting us know That the righteous guy who was so righteous and smart that he could tell that somebody was beaten, broken, and dying on the side of the road and dumb enough to tell somebody that they were didn't have what he wanted. Doesn't have any place in the church. It's not there. It's not there. That was the first person that passed by. And the man laid there and he thought he was going to die. He heard those foots, footsteps. He saw it was a priest and he was sure the priest would help him. But he felt more compelled by his religious responsibilities than he did his moral obligation to help. The call to serve the people was louder than the call to take care of his neighbor. And so the priest faded into the distance, 
The man was once, once again left to wonder how much longer he'd maintain consciousness and whether this was really the end. Until he heard more footsteps. This is what the Bible says. Not my perspective. Not your perspective. Not the UPC's perspective. Not pastor somebody 50 years ago. It's what the Bible says. He heard more footsteps. This time the footsteps sounded like it was somebody in a hurry. And again, he let out his loudest moan hoping that he'd get the attention of the hurried traveler. But it was a Levite, and the religious Levite saw the wounded man, and he did have thoughts of trying to help him. But he quickly dismissed those thoughts when he realized how late it would make him for his next appointment. He was too busy to help somebody who needed help. Too busy to help somebody who needed help. His desire for the the approval of other people clearly outweighed his willingness to show empathy. And as he hurried on past the bloody body, he reassured himself, I'm doing the right thing. And the man's condition worsened by the moment. The ironic thing about telling people that they're a mess, the ironic thing about being too busy to help somebody when they're a mess is what we need to realize is is every minute that we don't help them, they get worse. The Samaritan man lay there dying. And his eyes grew heavy and his breathing became labored. And he thought all hope was gone. And then he heard several footsteps. It sounded more like hoofs. And then he heard a voice that gave him hope until he heard the accent of the man. Because it was another, it was a Samaritan. And he figured that the Samaritan was more likely to finish him off than he was to help him. But surprisingly, the beast that the Samaritan rode came to a stop. The Samaritan man came near the man who lay by the road, beaten broken bones, and dying. Instead of telling him, hey, you're laying here beaten with broken bones and dying. And instead of saying, I'm too busy with things that are more important than you, he took the time to bandage his wounds put him on his beast, and take him to an inn. And he spent the night there to make sure the man would be okay. And the the next morning when he did have to leave, (coughs) he gave money to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, bind his wounds, and when I return... If what I gave you isn't enough, I'll give you more money. It's an incredible display to us of love for somebody other than ourselves. Whatever the reasons were, whatever reason the priest and the Levite had for not getting involved, what the story does to us is reveals to us the power of love and compassion that we should have for, for people who may not be exactly like us. One of the key components to the effective teaching ministry of Jesus was the fact that he used parables. He used them because he did, for two reasons. He wanted to conceal and he wanted to reveal the truth. Jesus used parables that approached su- subjects from, cult- from the cultural vantage point of his listeners. The parables were stories that Jesus used to illustrate an attitude or a principle. The parable of the Good Samaritan was one of those stories that Jesus used to answer two questions that were brought to him by a lawyer. The lawyer thought he was going to trap Jesus in some form or fashion. It was possible that he tried to <coughs> pardon me, to lead Jesus to discredit him by giving some uh, unusual answer that would cause the people to rail against him. 
Jesus used the, the parable to impart a principle that was much needed in that day. It was about love and our neighbors, loving them like we love ourselves. And it was evident when we read the passage this morning that Paul wrote to the epistles that Paul deeply cared about people. He deeply cared about the people that he was writing to. We know we people care by their actions, not by their words, not by the things they say, by the way they act, by the way they conduct themselves, and by the way they behave. When we read the letters that Paul wrote to the churches at Ephesus and Philippi and even Thessalonica, we get a sense of a deep concern and love that Paul carried for the saints in each one of those churches. Paul loved them. And along with words of encouragement and correction, Paul gave very specific prayers to them that he required uh, that be prayed regularly over them. He, we, we're given a glimpse in Thessalonians of those prayers. He said, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men even as we do toward you, to the end for the purpose that God may establish in your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. Paul prayed that the church in Thessalonica would increase and would abound in love, not only toward each other, but toward all of humanity. Paul echoed the teachings of Jesus when it came to the subject of love. And, he, and he, for some reason, I think it's a biblical reason about the foundation of being a disciple and what it really means to be a Christian, Paul found it necessary to remind the church that this attribute of love should be something that they possessed. We don't always love the way Jesus wants us to love. We don't always love the way Jesus wants us to love. If we examine the gospel accounts, we discover that Jesus spoke about the subject of love almost more than he did about sin. The Bible says in John 13, 34 and 35, a new commandment I give unto you. Jesus said, this is a new commandment. The Ten Commandments were good. And they were needful. And they were instructive under the law. But Jesus said, in this new covenant that I am here to build, I'm giving you a new commandment. A new commandment I give unto you. We want to do what the preacher says. We'll quote preachers all day long. And say, well, so-and-so said, and we should do that. We want to quote the law of the Old Testament and we want to live by the law of the Old Testament. We live still today in the church and mandate Old Testament principles. But the Savior, the Savior said, I'm giving you a new commandment, just as important as the first ten. That you love one another. How should we love one another? As I have loved you. That ye also love one another. By this. By this. Shall all men know that ye are my disciples. If you have love one to another. That's how people are going to know. Jesus said. You got to get this. If you don't get this, you're 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 spinning your wheels in your walk with God. I'm just telling you. I'm not the brightest bulb in the lamp, but I'm telling you, if you don't get this, you're going to stand in front of God and God's going to tell you. You remember March 17th? Ah, it was St. Patrick's Day. The pastor told you that I thought it was important that more than anything else you love one another. And you shoved it off and thought that all of your principles of holiness were more important than what I said. Jesus said, this is how people are going to know that you are my disciples. I'm going to tell you something. 
There are preachers that don't preach doctrinal truths about salvation. And people follow them by the thousands. And we ask ourselves, why do people follow those guys? They're not even preaching truth. And they don't always. But they love people's souls. Now, you're going to say, well, if they love their souls, they'd preach the truth. Well, that's a debatable thing. We could argue all day long. We could. But they love. They've learned to love. And people follow people who love. People are drawn to kindness. People are drawn to kindness. That's why people follow Jesus. Because when they were hungry, he fed them. When they had needs, he healed them. When they were in a quandary, he had soft, kind words for them. They didn't follow him because he turned tables over in the temple. And when he did that, it was right. But they didn't follow him because he turned over the tables of the change makers in the temple, Brother Anderson. They followed him because he loved them. They followed him because he loved them. So Paul prayed that we would understand it, and Jesus said, this is the commandment. Jesus established a precedent for the disciples and eventually for the early church that should often be reminded to us. He showed us how we should treat one another in the body of Christ. I'm a better cook than most of y'all in here. And I know I am. I'm a better cook than my wife. I guarantee I'm a better cook than Rob Presswood. <laughs> but I'm not doing any of you any good by telling you that. I'd say there's maybe, I'm looking around here, and uh, I can't cook greens like Sister Quinette. And I can't make uh, Italian food like, uh, Sister Joanna and I can't cook breakfast like Chris at all but the rest of you I can cook a lot of pretty good stuff but I'm not doing any of you any good by telling you I'm better than you are at it in fact if I told my mother that I made better fried chicken than she did she might get mad at me and it might cause a problem somewhere down the road. Right? Jesus showed us how we should treat one another. How we treat each other in the, in the church is a distinct testimony to people outside the church. You never know who's watching you. You never know who sees what you do. Our respect and love for one another is key to other people recognizing our commitment to God and the ways of God. Now, I'm going to tell you not only how we treat people who attend our church, but how we treat people who attend other churches is important. Because they look at us and they know what we look like, you know. And it's a sad day when you walk into the grocery store and you see somebody that you're quite sure is Pentecostal and they're ducking aisles so they don't have to talk to you. And other people see that stuff. Other people see that stuff. I go to a guy to get my taxes done. And there are other Pentecostal people that go there and get his taxes, get their taxes done. And all that guy wants to do is ask me, what in the world is wrong with those people? Why do they act the way they act? Why do they treat people the way they treat people? 
Why do they talk to people the way they talk to people? Be a hard sell to try to get him to come to church. Jesus showed us how we should treat one another. Our respect and love for one another is how other people recognize our commitment to God. So this passage of Scripture uncovers the way that we're supposed to love one another. We are supposed to love one another, each other, (coughs) as Jesus loved us. Jesus gave us the story of this wayfaring man or this man that was taken care of by the Samaritan when the priest and the Levite ignored him. So it's with that mind, that mindset that Jesus taught us that we're supposed to love one another the way that he loved us. (coughs) That's how Paul approached the subject of love to the church in Thessalonica. He talked about that attitude in prayer, and he encapsulated his desire to see the love of God increase and abound in the hearts and lives of every follower of Jesus Christ. In the first book of Thessalonians, Paul provided a path to help us understand this process. It's a process of growth. Like any other Christian principle that we apply to our life, it's a process of growth. The first thing that the author reminds the readers is that this is a work of God in us. It goes against your carnal nature. It goes against your carnal nature. Your carnal nature does not want to do it. It goes against it. The old man doesn't always want to be nice. I get tickled watching some folks do their Facebook posts in the morning, you know, and they talk about the coffee that they need, two cups or three cups or ten cups or a whole day's worth of coffee, you know, before they can. It's kind of funny. We're that way. We really are. That's honesty on display. Um, We're not always doing everything that God wants us to do. Being kind is a work of God in us. Another writer said that we should be kindly affectioned one to another. Paul said, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. So Paul knew that it was impossible for him or the Thessalonians to work up the kind of love that could reach out and abound toward all men. A love that could love people that ignore and neglect and abuse and shamefully treat us. A a love for people who we are sure know what they're supposed to be doing and aren't doing what we think they ought to be doing. It's hard to love those people. Paul said those are the people that we need to work the hardest to to show love to. Jesus said those are the people that we need to love. So the next thing the apostle did was express the direction that love has to take in the lives of believers. He stated that we had to increase and abound in love toward one another as well as toward all men. Not only must our love grow towards believers, but it also must grow towards everybody. That's why Paul stressed the importance of this kind of love only coming from God because while we were yet sinners, Christ loved us and died for us. While we were yet sinners, in Pentecost, we get the mindset, I think, This is the only way I can explain it. That after we've repented and been baptized and filled with the Holy Ghost, that God loves us more than he did when we were a sinner. And in reality, if you look at Scripture, I almost think he loved us more when we weren't under the blood than when we are. Because he made a way for me to get under the blood. 
And when no one else could purchase salvation, God did it himself. I'm going to preach a house of fire this morning in morning worship, but I want to go real slow this morning in Sunday school because we got to get this. If we don't get this right, we may be lost. I believe that it's so important to Jesus that we're kind and that we love one another that if we don't get it right, we might be lost. Jesus said it's a new commandment to love one another. It's, a new, it's not a new suggestion. It's not something that Brother Long teaches. Jesus said it's a new commandment. It's a commandment. Now, I'm trying to be just as tough as I can and still love you this morning. But I'm telling you, if you're not loving people, you're not pleasing God. That's the, that's the attitude. Paul's admonition to the church was to love everybody. Love everybody, you know. We got to love everybody. <laughs> I love my wife. That's why when she asked me, does this dress make me look fat? I just turn around and walk away. I'm not answering that. Neither way. I'm not saying, nope, it doesn't make you look fat. I'm not answering that question at all. That's one of those questions I'm not getting near. I'm not touching that thing. I love her too much to mess with that. Jesus loved us enough that he made a way. He didn't just tell us. He had every right to just tell us, you're lost. You're going to hell, and it's your own fault. Because guess what? I was lost. I was going to hell, and it was my own fault. And Jesus had every right because he created this thing so that all we had to do was just obey his, his, his commandments. And we would never die. And it's our fault. And he could have just told us, you're lost, you're going to hell, and it's your own fault. But he made a way. He loved us enough that he made a way. And he didn't hang on the cross and say, you're lost and you're going to hell. He just took it. Despising the shame, he endured the cross because he loves us. And the Bible says, Paul said, that's the way we're supposed to love one another. If we do that, the love of God is amazing. Watch what Luke chapter 6, verse, yeah, Luke 6.35 says. But love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and, and you will be children of the Most High. Because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. When we're kind to people who don't deserve it. If we practice that kind of love, it results in God establishing strong hearts in us. I have had people say, he's weak. Because he won't stand up and tell people what they need to hear. I don't agree with that. The Bible tells me that if I can keep my tongue and love people even when they need to hear, when somebody else thinks they need to hear something, and I can just pray for them and be kind to them, that builds a strong heart in me. 
builds a strong heart in me. The power of love requires great patience at times. Adam sinned, separated man from God. Man lived in sin, and it took God 4,000 years to bring a Savior. There's a whole lot of times that my carnality would like to tell people a lot of things, but sometimes we can do more damage than if we just pray for them and let God work on their lives. Sometimes some people are difficult to love. There are people that are just hard to love. But we've got to recognize it takes understanding no, ma no matter how other people may respond to us. We need to pray God will help us to increase and abound in the love that Paul described. In Romans chapter 12, Paul once again established the, le the need for love to be the overarching Christ-like attitude we must possess. When he told them, let love be without dissimulation. Anybody know what? Dissimulation means? Anybody know what the word dissimulation means? Anybody? It means without hypocrisy. It means without hypocrisy. Abhor that which is evil. We're not making an excuse for somebody being wrong. We abhor that which is evil. And we cleave to that which is good. But we be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. In honor, with honor preferring one another. Paul highlighted three main points about love and what it should look like when it's at work in the lives of a believer. The first one was love must not be hypocritical. It can't be fake. Love has to be sincere and genuine. Not just for people who look like me, but my love has to be genuine for everybody. <clears throat> the second thing, love should result in us uh, hating things that are evil. Real Christ-like love should desire good things, not just for me, but for other people as well. If that's the case, we hate evil because it's set out to destroy humanity. And we've got to be strong to stand against evil. So, in another place, Paul told us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness in high places, Spiritual wickedness. You're not. I'm not. Let me, let me say it that way because I don't want to be pointing fingers. I'm not going to straighten somebody out by trying to figure out how to straighten them out by carnal means. Used to get mad at Brother Hunt. There's people that go into his office and they'd want to counsel with him. And um, he'd sit there and listen to them. And when uh, Brother Hunt, I can't make the face exactly, but he used to make this face. He'd kind of stretch his mouth out, kind of grit his teeth a little bit, rub his head. When they'd be in the office, sometimes I'd have to go in with him, you know, because. He didn't want to just be in there by himself. So he'd sit in there and listen to him. And they wanted him to come up with some kind of amazing, wise words. They wanted him to tell them what was wrong and how to fix it. 
other people sometimes wanted him to call people into the office and clean their clocks. That, that happened to me a lot. People always wanted Brother Hunt to clean my clock. One person in particular always wanted Brother Hunt to clean my clock. <coughs> and, and instead, Brother Hunt would just pray about things. And when people would leave the office, Brother Hunt would tell me, they just need to pray through. And I would go home and I would yell at my wife. I, if I ever pastor, I'm going to read books and I'm going to learn how to counsel with people and I'm going to talk to people and I'm going to be better at counseling than Brother Hunt was. So I read the books. I figured out how you're supposed to talk to people and I talk to people and tell people things and they just keep going, keep on going on doing the things that they did before I talked to them. And I've come to the conclusion, most of the time, people just need to pray through. Because the battles that we fight are spiritual battles. Everything that we teach, here's what carnal people don't understand. And the carnal mind doesn't understand. Everything that we teach as the church, that when you leave the world and come into the church, you should give up, is not so that you look Pentecostal or you act Pentecostal or that we can tell who you are when we're in the grocery store. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. It's a spiritual battle. When you yield yourself to the flesh, the Bible says you become a servant to the flesh. You're never in control of the lusts of the flesh. That's a spiritual battle. And when the spiritual man becomes stronger than the carnal man, then the spiritual man guides your life. So this idea of we've got things that we say you need to lay down, that's a spiritual battle that you have to fight. The reason that you have trouble living for God is because your walk with God is a spiritual walk and the carnal man's still in control. Now that is true, but by the same token, Trying to fight that battle by carnal means will never win. I can't counsel people or tell people. I, can, I preach it. But I can't counsel or tell people that they need to lay things down and expect that that's going to work. If you see something that, that's not right, pray it off. Fast it off. It's a spiritual warfare. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God. I'm surprised by folks that have been in church all their lives or for years that still think that they can take care of spiritual matters by carnal means and justify themselves because they say it's the right thing to do. It's never right. You hear me? Because I'm the pastor, and I'm right this morning. And I'm right because I'm taking a biblical perspective in what I'm saying. It's never right to try to fight or win a spiritual battle by carnal means. Never. Never. It is never right to try to win a spiritual battle by carnal means. We've always got to fight this thing on a spiritual plane. We will never win if we don't fight it on a spiritual plane. It's been said that we're supposed to love the sinner but hate the sin. We should. But how do we do that so that the individual in question feels love and compassion? The church in Thessalonica appears to have gained a good grasp on the display. 
<clears throat> because Paul said, and I'm going to quit, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves taught of God love one to another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are, are, are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. Even though it appears they understood the principle, Paul prayed that it should abound. Even though we know we ought to love, we need to love more. We need to love more. We've got to love other people, and we've got to consider other people before ourselves. We've got to love people, and we've got to consider other people before we consider ourselves. Before I ever open my mouth, I got to think, my God, is what I'm going to say or do, is it going to hurt somebody? Even if what I say is right, if I'm going to cause somebody to stumble, I should pray about it rather than talk about it. Sister Miller used to sing a song, if I can, I've done this before, but if I can help somebody as I travel along, if I can help somebody with a word or a song, if I can help somebody, blah, 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 then my living will not be in vain. I want to be what Paul said I ought to be, and I want to be what Jesus said I ought to be. And if I'm going to do that, i got to love everybody. We used to sing in the old church. We used to sing a song. Old-time religion makes me love everybody. Makes me love everybody. I need to love people enough that I don't want to hurt them more than I love them enough that I feel like I need to let them know what's right. Because this is a spiritual battle. And the way that I'm going to win every single spiritual battle is to take it to the Lord. Take it to God. Pray and fast. Seek God. Stand with me. We're done. Have you, have, do you love that person enough that you're trying to reach? Do you love them enough that you fasted for them? Jesus loved us enough. We're supposed to love the way that he loved. Jesus loved us enough that he died for us. He gave his life for us. So this discipleship thing, it's kind of a tough thing every now and then. Talking about being a disciple. Is kind of a tough thing. This is one of those lessons, you know, unselfishness. You can't really talk about unselfishness without hitting a few points pretty hard. <clears throat> but Jesus and Paul and Brother Long love us enough that all three of them will tell us we have to love people unselfishly. And that's where we need to live. It's about 10 till. We're going to take about 10 minutes and we're going to start morning worship. Thank you for your attendance. God bless you. We'll start morning worship in a few minutes. Go do whatever it is you got to do. If you see somebody you don't know, shake their hand, and uh, we'll come back. God bless you.